you for your gift, and you can be sure it'll be used for the next church. Well, term, term service is over now, Brother Jim. Thank you, Brother Tom. Or, no. <laughs> hey, don't laugh. It's going to happen to you in just a little while. He who laughs, laughs, laughs the best. Number 579 will be our, be our hymn this morning. As we close, and as always, it could be a time in your life when this is your day. This is your time if you're not a Christian. If you're tired of the life you're living, why not try something new? You may be amazed at what you find. Number 579. And the next song, basically, it doesn't deal with the human heart. That's a pump. Deals with your mind. That's the seed of learning, intelligence, and all of the things that God has given us. I am so glad, the Doc said, to see this many out this morning. The singing's been good. If the Lord be willing, in this coming year, we're second Sunday into a new year. I'd like to Try to bring about 12 lessons. Now there's an old saying, and you've heard it time and time again. It said, practice what you preach. <clears throat> well, I'm going to turn that around. I'm going to turn that around the exact opposite because it's more important that we preach what we practice. You'd be amazed <clears throat> that the people within the body of Christ doesn't even really know why we do something. They know that we do it. And they come together. And we <coughs> but there's cause and effect and reason for everything. And I'm going to start this morning with Genesis. And one of the reasons that I wanted to do that, actually there's only two schools of thoughts in people. You either believe in creation or you believe, believe in evolution. It's only two systems there are. About 200 years ago, there was a man by the name of Darwin. And he was born. And he brought on this theory. He said, listen, you know, things just happened. And for the last 125 years, that theory has been spread by people. And it's even now in your schools. It's no longer theory. It's basically taught as fact. Now, I'm going to give you some advice. Don't you dare depend upon someone else for your eternal de destiny when you leave here. And make no mistake about it. We will all leave. It's only a matter of time. And we're not going to be able to blame someone else for our lives or how we lived it or what we believed. We will try that, but it won't work. You have a right to believe what you want this morning. And as we look at just the simplicity of evolution here in a few minutes, I'm going to try to do something that scholars have been in argument over for years. If you want to believe that you sprang from a monkey and that your grandparents and your forefathers were monkeys, I'll defend your right to do that. I'll defend your right to do that. But I want to think that mine were a little bit better. Or if you want to believe that you sprung from a one-celled amoeba, and that some way that just happened to split off, and on the shores of the sea when this amoeba come up, out popped a beautiful man woman. You can believe that if you want to. But I believe we're better than that, aren't we? And 
They won't let us teach creation in our schools. And so it must be the job of parents, of the home, and of the church to get it right. You better get it right. Because there's a lot right now. This first one is, why do we practice and why do we preach what we preach? Now I want you to go this morning to the book of Genesis. Let me read you just real quick. I feel good this morning. I feel challenged by the future. I feel challenged by this year. And there's a lot of people down there that say, oh, it's bad times. Been bad times before. There'll be bad times tomorrow. What are we waiting for? An ideal situation? Do you think that's going to happen in your earthly existence before everything comes together <coughs> and you're totally happy? You can believe that if you want to. But in reality, it ain't going to happen. This coming year is not going to be much different than the one past. And so it's important how we react to it, how we think about it. <clears throat> there was a, we've had some great men in our lives, and I'm happy for them. You know, good scientists, and, 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 and God give them the knowledge, and God give us the doctor, and, and God give him the hands to do it, and he gave him the stuff to do it, and, and he put the stuff in the earth to make the medicine for, and when the time was right, it all came together. <coughs> And we need to enjoy that. But there's something else about us, and that's where we're cheating ourselves. Cheating ourselves. I'm going to share that with you in a minute. Sir Isaac Newton, brilliant man. And we need him today, and we, we need him tomorrow, because we're all going to live better because of science. Think about what you've got and how science has influenced your life and your daily living, and it's made it better. Be thankful for it. Don't put it down. A truly scientific person does not agree, disagree with the Word of God. Newton had this good friend. I'll, I'll just read you this little track real quick. Sir Isaac Newton had a friend who, like himself, was a great scientist. But this friend was an unbeliever. So we set the stage. You've got a believer and you've got a non-believer. And the two men often discuss the Christian faith. And don't ever be afraid to discuss your faith with someone. Don't be ashamed of it. It's what makes you what you are. But don't be argumentative about it. You're going to lose. And that's exactly what the old devil likes. He likes contention. He likes strife. Just state your case. Believe it in your heart. And live it. Newton had a skillful mechanic make a replica of a solar system. In the center was a large gilded ball representing the sun. Revolving around this were several smaller balls fixed on the ends of arms of varying lengths, representing the planets in their proper order. Mercury, Venus, the Earth, Mars, and so forth. These balls were so geared together by cogs and belts as to move in perfect harmony with the crank when it was turned. And everything moved by design. One day as Newton sat reading in the study with a mechanism on a large table near him, his friend stepped in. He recognized at a glance what was on the table. He saw it. He believed it, and he was amazed. Slowly, he turned the crank, and with ever evident admiration, he watched the heavenly bodies moving in their relative speeds in their orbits. And standing off a bit, he explained, what an exquisite thing that is. Who made it? Without looking up from his book, Newton answered nobody. 
quickly turning to Newton, the unbeliever said, Evidently, you did not understand my question. I asked, Who made this thing? Looking up now, Newton solemnly assured him that nobody had made it, but that the aggregate of matter so much admired had just happened to assume the form that it was in. But the astonished man replied, and he was getting warmer, a little bit angrier. You see, that happens when you believe something and can't prove it. And when it becomes challenged, we become offensive about it. You must think I'm a fool. Of course somebody made it. And he is a genius. <clears throat> I'd like to know who he is. Laying his book aside, Newton arose and laid a hand on his friend's shoulder. This thing is but a puny imagination of a much grander system whose laws you know, and I am not able to convince you that this mere toy is without either designer or maker. Now tell me, by what sort of reasoning do you reach such conclusions? Some of the things this morning that I'm going to say you may disagree with me because it will depend on the depth that you have thought about it and have pursued it as to what your understanding will be. <laughs> All right. Verse 27, Genesis 1. If you look at that first chapter of Genesis, it's all about what he put here. Number two goes into detail as how he done it. I read that one time when I was a young Christian, and I said, whoa, whoa, this can't be. He just made man over here in verse 1, and now he come over in verse 2, and he tells me how he done it. I said, is there a conflict? There's not a conflict. Because chapter 2 takes you into detail of that design. But I want to read you something that has become more evident to me in my later years of preaching. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them and God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth. Subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth. upon the earth. Do you believe, and that is one of the things that separates us from the animal kingdom. We have the ability to logically approach something, think it through, make a conviction about it, and live with the results. An animal operates upon the instinct. And if humans today in all of the bad things and all of the good things that we do, if you will simply tell yourself when you walk out of here today, I am made in the image and the likeness of God. There's something better in me than what I have done. There is something in me better than what I am at the present time. He wasn't talking about our physical bodies. We are all different. God could care less in that sense. All he done is he just took some dust of the earth and he molded it into a form and he knelt down and he blew in to that form the breath of life. And the Bible said that man became a living spirit. If we understand what we are, he said, Dust thou art, and to dust thou shalt return. We shall be spending more time upon our spiritual self, or the godly part that lives within us, than we do on the physical. Who can stop aging? 
I see these commercials on television too, and I'll be sitting there. They say, boy, they got one. If you take them wrinkles out of your skin, out of your skin, and I said, Sue, let's get a gal. <laughs> I'm going to tell you something. My eternal spirit is the most important thing in life to me because it's going to go back to God who gave it. I am a spirit made in the likeness and the image of God. And I told some people the other day at a funeral service, I said, this is the best of us. This is when we are at our best. It's when we can have love and compassion, when we can feel hurt, we can feel disillusionment. We can feel pain. This is the best of us because that is the part of God that makes us different. <coughs> Think about it. Made in the image and the likeness of God. Think deeply of it. What do people see in us? What do they expect out of us? There's a simple passage in the Bible. In all the years of creation, we had it mastered. Do unto others as you would that they should do unto you. What, one of the very first examples in the Bible, there's nothing new under the sun, it's just changed around, and it comes in different forms. Same thing's being done, there's nothing new. Adam and Eve, two of their sons, Cain and Abel, you can find that also in Genesis. And God had asked them to give something back because God had blessed them. And I had to do a lot of studying on that. And I said, there's a lesson in there somewhere, but it's not evident. <coughs> Cain killed the soil. And that's important. I told Sue yesterday, you know, look what we are doing. And I catch myself doing it. It's like, boy, bread and milk's gone up, the staples of life. And we howl about it, but yet a movie ticket can increase three times. And we never say a word and pay it. It's time that we got our priorities in order. The Bible said that Cain was a tiller of the soil. And Abel was a keeper of the flocks. They both appeared before God and they gave what they had. And one of the first things that God did, he said, Abel, your offer was good. I want that. He said, Cain, can't handle yours. And I said, there's something wrong in this picture. There was blood involved with Abel's sacrifice. And down through the annals of time to keep humanity alive. The blood that flows through your body today, you cannot live without. It's life-giving, it's life-sustaining. It was to be an ongoing thing that they were to do. And somebody says, God is not fair. I hear that every day. God is not fair. That is not your call to make as to what is fair in the sight of God and what is not. Because we use our human intellect to try to tell God how to run his business. I got away from that a long time ago. And let me tell you something. It'll bring a happiness to you that you have never known before to not be in a conflict with God. So one of the very first reactions was, 
These two brothers were in the field one day, and the Bible said they were talking, and Cain became angry, and he rose up. And he slew his brother. He took his violent hatred of God because God had turned his sacrifice down and God directed his anger at his brother. Sound familiar? There's a lot of people today that are still running from God. They have trouble with their mate. They have trouble with their children. They have trouble with their business. They have trouble with their gut, with everything. And yet the answer to happiness lies before us. And we blame our brethren for it. Cain paid a price. You've heard the old saying today, the way of Cain. And everything that is evil, everything that is hated, everything that is ungodly is said to be the way of Cain. And God took care of Cain. He said, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to identify you so that nobody will hurt you. And even in that, God took care of Cain. Why? Because Cain was made in the image and the likeness of God. When you approach people, <clears throat> do you say, I want to see what's in you that is best? Or do we a lot of times, for whatever reason, go the opposite direction? lose a lot of the joy of just being here on a daily basis because of little things that we just can't seem to get around and they aggravate us to death. If you can do something about it, then let's do it. Let's get it on. Let's get it changed. Let's get it done. If you can't do anything about it, are you willing to commit it into the hands of God and say, here it is? Easy said. Difficult to do. But once that is done, my God and I, how very thou art. God, don't let me be angry. I remember how you suffered. Those songs weren't just put up there at random. There's a message behind them. Just as there is this last one. I want you to think about that song when you say it. Out of consideration to our elderly, to people who have made plans at the church, I'm going to bring this sermon to a close. Because I'm like the old fellow was at church one time, he's just preaching, and he told the audience, he said, I've run out of something to say. I've run out of gas. I need to quit. Somebody said, Amen. I've got my message out. And I tell you, I thought about it at 11.54 this morning. I was in bed. I was, I was awake. And I said, I think I've got it now. I'm going to sleep. And everything's in your hands. And I slept. In the year 2009, it's already started. This will be the year of Darwin. It's his birthday. They're going to celebrate that. Keep in mind, watch what I tell you. Evolutionists will push harder and harder and harder against the creation of God. And if you want to join that force, and, and you know, I have never heard anybody say, my grandparents three or four places back with monkeys. <laughs> Any tapers? You know why you won't take it? It is that foolish to you. But to some of the great minds that have never known of the love and the transforming power of God to bring that spirit of God out that's in you, 
like Nicodemus was. Jesus said, Nicodemus, there's a process. He said, you've got to be born again. Not of flesh, but of the Spirit. And so, in Nicodemus's awakening of that Spirit of God that was in him, when Nicodemus done what Jesus said to do, that Spirit come together. And it'll save us, it'll keep us safe, it'll take us to heaven, it will bring on immortality. Anything outside of that, we'll be gone. <coughs> One of the other things, and as the, the minister here at church and pastor, something else you're going to see in 2000, it's already started, or 2009. Now, according to all of the great minds and all of the great civilizations, about 2012 is going to do a scene. The Mayan calendar, that great civilization, ceases in 2012. Nostradamus, in all of his great teachings, 2012 is about where it all starts. You know what I say there. I, I, listen, I love to read. I need, I, I, I love to increase what little knowledge I've got, and sometimes I forget that, you know, when I just done it. They don't know. And what does it really make any difference? I may not be here in 2000 or 2012. Fact of the matter, I may not be here tomorrow. And that's something to think about. But if I'm not, there's something wonderful, wonderful, beyond my description. I know it exists because he told me. But it's very important what I do with my life while I'm here. Always remember, there is a part of God that is in you. What are we doing with it? Are we enjoying it? Or are we kicking against that spirit? Paul said in my body, there is a constant warfare, my flesh against my spirit. And he said these two are contrary each to the other. you got some options. You've been here today. And you came for a reason. And it is part of my job to strengthen you. And to encourage you. To have a closer walk. With what's inside of you. May the Lord bless you. And may he keep you. Thank you for being here today. We're going to stand and stand. If you're not a Christian today, just ask yourself, why not? Why not? And then just do something about it. Like you've got some time to do it. May the Lord bless you. Let's stand and sing our song together.